levels of you know, long spikes to the downside. There was an area of support based on this uptrend at about 310 Rand. And you can see that the stochastic was quite oversold and there was a bit of positive divergence coming in there. So based on that, I figured there was a good, a good trade to be had on the long side by buying Anglo Gold at, at this level. And where I set the stop loss in this trade was basically a move below the lows of, of January, where it was around about 300 Rand to actually introduce a, a, lateral, a lateral line there. You can see I didn't want it to violate this area here, so the stop loss essentially was a move below this area. And since the, the broadcast is now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Um, the stock's moved up quite nicely subsequently, and it seems to be working. And right now, I'm looking for it to move basically back up to the 350 rand area, where there's quite a big level of overhead resistance, and I'll take profit to that area. So that was where I set the stop loss on this one. In terms of the amount to risk on a trade, I'm looking at it at 2% of your equity. Now, what you would need to do is calculate the difference between where you enter the trade and where your stop loss is, and work out how much that is as a movement on each share, and then divide that number into 2% of your total trading equity to figure out what, you know, what quantity of shares or CFDs or single stock futures you can afford to buy. I always use 2% as a, as a rough rule of thumb. If you read any of the Market Wizards books, you'll find that uh, typically all the really successful traders over time tend to use 2% as a, as a maximum risk. A couple of guys use it a little bit more, but generally speaking, that's uh, considered to be quite risky. Now, if you have a look at another example of, a, of, of another recent trade that I did, this is NASPERS that I've got here now. And uh, this one didn't work out, unfortunately. The stop loss actually had to be executed on this. I noticed there was a, a level of uptrend support going back over a couple of months there. And uh, this stock typically had been very, very strong over recent months. Any sell-off in the market, we noticed, didn't, NASPERS wouldn't stay down for very long. Quickly, the buyers would come in and take the share price higher. And recently, I saw the stock move down to around about 380 rand, this area over here. You see the stock was becoming somewhat oversold at that stage. And uh, figured that there was a good trade to be had on the long side. Unfortunately, to my detriment, the, the CEO of NASPERS, uh, of, of Tencent, came out the following day and said that they were expecting growth in uh, 10 cents revenues to slow down in, in coming years. So the stock took a big dive to the downside the following day. And it, it basically gapped down below this trend line and, and uh, I needed to execute a stop loss here. Unfortunately, this stock actually got sold down very heavily the day after. So my stop loss, whilst it was to move just below this uptrend, the stop loss actually it didn't quite catch me there. I ended up selling a bit lower down than where I would have ideally wanted to and lost a bit more than the 2%, which, uh, which was my set risk in the case of this trade. That happens sometimes, but the point is you have to execute your stop loss. And what you can see subsequently is that the technical damage that has been done to NASPERS has actually been quite significant. Uh, the stock hasn't managed to regain that trend line it bounced back up to the underside of the trend line and to the underside of the uh, moving averages over here, the 50-day moving average, and the stock subsequently started to drift lower again. So, so in, in this case, you know, I would expect that this share price might remain under a little bit of pressure because of the technical damage that has been done. And the stop loss certainly did save you from further losses in this case. Another one that I've got where the stop loss had to be executed recently was a trade on Anglo Platinum. And I did this trade on the Traders Corner TV show a little while ago. Uh, essentially, I noticed there was an uptrend over there coming in around about 700 Rand on the share price. And there was also an area that had previously been uh, overhead resistance. Uh, you can notice there and there and there and there many times the stock had battled to break above that resistance. It eventually broke above it, 
and pulled back to retest this trend line that what, what was previously resistance became an area of support. Now I had a double support area. I had an uptrend and I had this overhead resistance line which had become support. So, and, and there were cold congestion of moving averages in this area around about 700. The stock was also oversold if you have a look at the stochastic. So I figured at 700 rand, that would probably be a decent area to be buying Anglo Platinum. And uh, there was even a reversal candle to confirm that, uh, that the buyers seemed to be interested. But quite quickly thereafter, the stock broke down below the support area that I had identified as a good entry point for the trade. And you can see what happened subsequently. The share actually moved quite a lot lower. It went from 700 down to 630 rand. So it dropped another 10% after the stop loss had been triggered. And uh, well, I was quite glad that the stop loss saved me in that case because there was a lot more downside and could have lost a lot more money had I had I not executed a stop loss in this case. So that, that, those are examples of, of how I use a stop loss. Typically, it's, a, it, it's technically te technical analysis based. I'll look for an area where I feel a high probability trade can be entered based on support lines, moving averages, momentum indicators confirming the trade. And uh, if, if the stock trades below that, that uh, area of support, well, then the stop loss has to be triggered. Typically, I'll use a daily close below the stop loss area because what I have noticed happening on occasions is that you can have a missed deal during the day or you can have a, a brief spike down in trading action. I'll bring up a, a chart of, of BHP bulletin here to, uh, to illustrate the point of something that actually happened recently and uh, it, was, it was quite quite unfortunate for those people who had automated stop losses on the stock. But if you zoom in over here, have a look uh, in late February, the stock had been drifting back. Uh, the stock had been pulling back. <clears throat> and have a look at this candle over here. I'll zoom in on this a little bit more just to make it even more apparent. Look at that. That massive spike to the downside. The stock dropped about 12 rand on a single trade. Somebody had fat fingers in this case and and put in the wrong price with the large quantity of shares and it smashed through all the bids and we ended up seeing BHP bulletin dropping by, by literally 12 rand in a single trade. And uh, the stock went into intraday auction, etc. But the point is that if you'd had an automated stop loss or you were applying an intraday stop loss on a move like that, you would have been stopped out unnecessarily. And that can be exceptionally frustrating. And it, it happens from time to time. I've seen it quite a few times in my career. And you know, it doesn't only happen on illiquid stocks. This is BHP Billiton we're talking about. It's one of the most liquid shares on the market. And we still saw this mistrade happen, which, which went down. And it would have taken out automated stop losses without a doubt. So for that reason, I like to use uh, an end of day close uh, to execute a stop loss rather than intraday uh, movement. Sometimes I've been asked, you know, well, you, the problem with that scenario is that you you could end up with a daily close, which is significantly far away from where your stop loss was, and and that is true. I mean, to maybe mitigate that, you could always look at the stock intraday, have a look, see if you think that the trading action really is quite strong below your stop loss level. Then maybe execute half the stop loss during the day and maybe wait for uh, later in the day towards the end of the trading session to perhaps execute the rest of the stop loss. So that's really how I work it. Um, we like to go for, for questions. Folks, it's Simon Brown here. Uh, any questions we've got generally around stop losses that Garth has shown us? Uh, as is always the thinking, I think, keep it nice and simple. Um, if you've got questions, obviously welcome to ask text box. Or if you've got audio, you can, if you've got a microphone rather, you can raise your hand and we'll take an audio question.
Uh, Fumani, I see you there. I'll activate you in a moment. Hi there. Um, I'm on and, uh, and, uh, and, and if you say 2%, don't you think that if everybody thinks that 2%, you know, you're going to have a stock loss and it's 2%, if somebody sitting with a big chunk of shares, they're going to knock you out on that 2% and then it creates a, a kind of a ripple effect on, on the other, um, uh, and the other people underneath you and then the stock will probably collapse by saving two percent if maybe it's two percent. I don't know if the question is here or not. Okay, okay. We we got the question, thanks. I just I just want to clarify what I mean by the two percent. Two percent implies two percent of your trading capital that you're willing, that you're willing to use if the trade goes wrong. So I'm, so I'm, I'm not saying that the stop loss, stop loss is ten percent below your entry point. The two percent and the stop loss, stop loss of, of, on this can, be, can be anywhere. anywhere. Uh, it could be one percent away from your entry point. It could be five percent away from your entry point. It really, it really depends quite a lot on the on the technical setup and how and how loose you want to apply that stop loss. So, so it doesn't. I'm not saying it's two percent away from your entry point on the share price. I'm saying that a stop loss needs to be uh, uh, relevant to two percent of your trading capital. In other words, in other words, if the trade goes wrong and, and you end up needing, end up needing to execute a stop loss. The maximum, the maximum that you can in a case like, case like that is a 10 percent trading trading capital. So if you've so got a you hundred thousand rand account, you stand, you stand to lose two thousand rand in one in one trade should yeah. that trade go wrong. For money, uh, Simon here again. I'm going to be doing a webinar particularly dedicated to the two percent rule as well. So we will delve into that more. Uh, Garth, I got a couple of text questions here from Paul Cress. He's asking if you move in the stop loss as the stock moves. Okay, good okay, question. question. Typically, Typically what you can do is once the stock loss is moving in the right direction for you, then you can, you can move the stop loss up to your entry point. In other words, in other words then you eliminate all risk from the trade. And what some, and what some people like to even do is then begin to add to the trading position where you actually increase the size of the trade once you notice that it is moving in the right direction. And then you can ratchet that stop loss up to, uh, to, uh, to compensate for the risk, risk, risk that you take in by increasing the position size. That's the process, That's the process pyramiding. of pyramiding. Also, what also I've, what I've found works quite, well, quite well if you want to, to do a trailing, trailing stop loss on a, on a nicely trending share is a, a, a nine-day nine exponential yeah. moving average. That can, that work, can quite work quite well. And it can and keep it you in a trade for quite a long, quite a long time uh, 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 until that moving right. average breaks. It works, it works it particularly well, well with stocks that have been trained nicely. Question here um, from uh, Zafan Princely. I think I've got your name wrong, but the Princely part right. Apologies. Question is a good one. If you say that you execute end of day, do you sell in the last 15 minutes or in the opening auction the next day? That depends. I'll sometimes, I'll look, sometimes look at the way the stock is trading towards the end of the day, and, and if I can see that it's weak going into the close, then I'll generally execute it that same day towards the end of the trading session. Uh, if you really are strict about the, the end of day close, then what you can do is, is wait for the next morning to execute that. Um, the trouble is waiting for the first thing the next morning, sometimes you can have a, a little bit of a lack of liquidity in the first half an hour of trade, and occasionally you don't get the best pricing. So it's, it's a, you need to be a little bit flexible with these things. You, you, you know, as much as you need to always execute your stop loss and you have to manage your risk, that's an absolute must with trading. But when it comes to actually executing that stop loss, you, know, you, you, you need to be a little bit flexible. In my own experience, I've found very often that if your stop loss is violated intraday, quite often it, it's, it's going to trade there. Uh, for longer, might trade there the next day again, and and may even close below that level. So, you know, you need to apply a little bit of flexibility to it. The point is always execute your stop losses. Don't ignore them. They will save you a lot of pain, and they will help you save your capital in in 90% of cases.
Another question from Fumani. Um, what is the minimum amount to start trading? Great question. Tough question. Yeah, it, yeah, it is a tricky question and it's one that I get asked quite a lot. My, my, my answer is normally that you should probably start with about 50,000 Rand if you're really going to take it seriously. Uh, the, reason uh, the reason I say that is that, the, that the, you are going, going to find that you get trades, get trades wrong, you make mistakes, you take, you take losses, and you, and you need, need to have a sufficient capital amount of capital in your account that allows, that allows you to actually punch your, punch your way out of the corner if you should find yourself in a corner. Uh, trading, uh, trading with a very small amount of capital doesn't, doesn't give you that much leeway. So you, can, you, know, you aren't able to take as many knocks and it can quite quickly wipe you out to the trader if you come in undercapitalized. So I always think a minimum of 50,000 Rand is, is, a, is a good number to start with, preferably even 100,000 Rand. But, uh, but coming in with less than that, you need to know that you, the odds are, some, are somewhat stacked against you. Okay, I'm going to come to your question in a moment. Fumani's got a backup question. He says 50,000 for one shares or for five shares, no, as a pot of cash. Look, look Fumani, it depends, it depends on, what on what you're trading. If you're trading, trading leverage, leverage products, then obviously, obviously you can make a take a thousand thousand rand and gear, it, gear up. it up. And, and yeah, you, could you, know, you could gear, gear it up, up in some cases even as much as ten times if you want. You certainly wouldn't advise that. But, but the, 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 point point is, the point is, you, you can, you can gear, gear that money up if you're using yeah. leverage product, that's but that's where it becomes even more and more important to manage, manage the stop loss, loss and manage, manage the risk. When you've got, when you've got leverage, the potential, potential to lose a lot of money is even greater. So, so to, answer, to answer your question, is the 50,000 for multiple shares? Well, yes, yes it is. Uh, and, 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 and even, even and more, more relevant if you are, 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 are trading on a leverage product. But you can, but apply, you can that apply that same thinking to underlying, underlying shares or to leverage products. The point is, the point is, is always manage, manage your risk, irrespective of what product you're trading. Justin, I'm going to come to you in a second. Uh, the question from Kern, he says, let's say my 2% is 2,500. How do I work out where I need to put my stop loss if I want to buy GLD at 93? Kern, another way around, you would look at 93 Rand and say if my stop loss is at 92, my risk is one rand, therefore one rand to two and a half, I can buy two and a half thousand shares. So it doesn't tell you where to place the stop loss, it tells you how many to purchase. Justin, you're on? I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Well, I trade primarily uh, Wall Street and the FTSE and some Forex, and I find the 20 MA and the 10 EMA very useful. I was just wondering if you use um, any indicator support in addition to, to class action. With the, with the technicals that I use, I generally like to keep it fairly simple. So, so by, saying by saying that I'm looking at a candlestick chart, I'm using, I'm using trend lines, trend lines really, simple really simple trend lines. I'm using, I'm using moving, moving averages, and, and the ones I like, I like most and stocks, stocks for the day and the day and the day and the day and the Obviously, for the forex, that's going to be a bit different. Uh, uh, and then I also like to use a, a momentum indicator, primarily, primarily a stochastic okay. oscillator, and, and occasionally a relative strength index as well. As well. I keep it fairly simple. simple. Those, are those are the, the, the indicators indicator 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 that I use the most, and I tend, and I tend not to complicate it more any more than that. My experience, my experience has been that from watching, watching other traders in the market and watching other technical analysts who really are really right, they all, they all actually keep it very, very simple. And, and I, I think I, I you think need to be careful, be careful of over complicating the technicals. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a whole, a whole heap load of, uh, of, of possible technical indicators you can use. I just drop down, down, down the list on my meta stock here. I'll scroll, I'll through, scroll through them and through them you can see there's hundreds, hundreds of indicators that you can use if you but my, but my sense, sense rather you rather use indicators that are indicators popular, that are popular and, and are followed by most players, players in the market. The reason being, the reason being that the technical analysis is, is to some extent a self-fulfilling thing. thing. And, uh, and uh, you, need you, probably, need you probably look at the same indicators that most of the traders in the market are using because then you'll find that the self-fulfilling 
Don't over, don't over complicate it. Don't, don't use too many indicators. You'll also, you'll also start find that they're that they that they that one another sometimes. Uh, another question from Zafin Prinsley. Drop me an email. Tell me how to pronounce your name. I get your names wrong. If you do a leverage trade, do you use 2% on the underlying price, which would actually be 20% if leveraged 10 times, or the 2% on the actual? Um, okay, that's a similar to the earlier question that we got. It's, it's, it's not 2% of the share price. It's, 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 I'm referring to 2% of your trading capital. Maybe I should, Maybe I should put this in, a, in an example to make it a bit more clear. I'll bring up, I'll bring up the yeah. earlier example of Anglo Gold that, I, that I've traded recently. I bought the I stock bought the at 310 rand, and, and I, I, I let see my account, 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 and I'm willing and to, I'm willing to two risk 2%. Two two I'm, I'm willing to lose 2,000 rand, rand if I'm wrong. I have a look at my entry level of 310. 310. And I say that I'm, say that I'm going to stop loss, stop loss and I'm at 300, 300 rand. So if, so if the stock trade, trade is below 300 rand, then I'm out. Then I'm out. What, I need, what I need to do is take the 2%, 2 which is 2,000 rand, divided divide it by 10 rand, which is the amount of risk that I'm willing to take on the share itself. 310 minus 310 rand. And, and I divide 2,000 rand by 10 rand. Use me with an answer. 200, 200 shares. And that's, and that's how many shares I can afford to buy in this case. And, and, and if, it if it goes wrong, wrong and I lose 2,000 rand, then I've lost 2% of my trading capital. If it goes, if it goes right and the stock, and the stock goes, goes to 350, then, then it means I've made, made 40 rand per share times 200, 200 shares make 8, make 8,000 rand. So, so uh, my risk, my risk to reward in a case like that is 41. In other words, I stand to make 8,000 rand. I stand, I stand to lose 2,000 rand if I'm wrong. And in essence, you've bought 200 shares, whether you bought the shares or two contracts, which would give you 200 shares. Same risk, same reward. Difference is the outlay. Any more questions, folks? Raise your hands if you've got mic. We can take audio or if you want to put a text base. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. We seem to be out of questions. Uh, my thanks. That one's just coming through again. And this is a brilliant question. And uh, best of luck, Goss. How long does it take to become a reasonably successful trader? Uh, I'll preempt it by saying it took me five years of losing. Yeah, it's yeah, a, very that's a very good question. You know, if you, know, if you read Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he refers there to the 10,000 hour rule. And if you, want, if you want to become professional or consider yourself relatively good at anything, playing chess, playing chess or trading, trading whatever, whatever. 10,000 10, hours is, is a good figure, good figure and typically the, the amount of time you need to spend dedicated to the cause to become good at something. And I think, and I think trading, trading is very, very, very relevant. And I've been, I've been at, at it since I was, I was 16, 16 and I think I've really been trying hard at it since I was about 23. 23. I'm, 30, I'm 31 now. And I still, and I still don't think I know, think I know everything. So, so I think, I think uh, five, to five to ten years, years if you really, if you really dedicate yourself to the course of learning, I think you'll, you'll become a good trader. It's certainly a journey. I've been doing it 16, and to iterate what Goff says, still learning, still making mistakes, um, eking out a profit, but it, it's a process. It certainly takes some time. Uh, a couple of people are asking for books that you recommend. Uh, I'm going to throw my favorite, which is Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone, which is pure psychology. Goff, you got any? Yeah, yeah, I, I like the Mark Douglas books as well. He, he also wrote another book called, called The Disciplined Trader, which is also fantastic. Uh, I'd, highly I'd highly recommend the Market Wizards books by Jack Schwager. Those, Those are interviews with some of the greatest traders of all time, and that is a fascinating read. I also, uh, I also like uh, Marcel Link, who wrote a book called High Probability, probability Trading. I thought, I thought that book was excellent. And there's, and there's a book by Dr. 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 Alexander Elder called Trading, Trading for a Living, which is also, also very good. 
I certainly put those books that I could not have been out of them. Those five five would be on my essential reading list. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there because we're approaching the half hour and we always try and say we're going to keep these short and sweet. Uh, 30 minutes enough. The webinar will be up on the site within two days. We'll get Garth back another time without doubt. Thanks to you all for attending. And thanks to Garth for helping us to stop losses. Thanks. Thanks.